Okay, let's have fun. Let's look at some art and think about ideology. How, what ideology are we, are we asked to enter into? What is uh, some historical background? Because that is always useful for thinking about ideology. And also what rhetorical uh, tactic is it appealing to? Either ethos or ethics, pathos or emotion, or logos or logic. And before us, this painting is a, is a wonderful painting by Theodore Jericho, a French painter. And this is the raft, the raft of the Medusa from 1818 to 1819. And this is an example of a historical painting that is documenting an event that was fairly contemporaneous with Jericho um, during this time. So he was inspired by recent, near recent events in French history. And um, he wanted to create, to comment upon it, right? Any, any sort of depiction of an event is per presenting a certain perspective. And it's our job to figure out what Jericho is trying to say about this shipwreck, this uh, raft of the Medusa. And of course that requires just a little bit of context, a little bit of history, and which I'm happy to supply. And so the event that Jericho is talking about happened in, on July 2nd, 1816. So fairly recent after you know finishing this painting. And it was a shipwreck of the frigate Meduse, uh, which is French for Medusa. And what happened here is that the captain of this frigate was appointed to this position by the newly established monarchy. And if you know anything about French history, especially during the, the late 1700s and 1800s, they had a series of revolutions, the people rising up against the monarchy. And then you sometimes you would have periods where the monarchy would be back, etc. So this was a period in which the monarchy had been reestablished for a bit and um, the king appointed this uh, captain and being, being appointed a, a ship was a prestigious thing back in the day. But the problem was that this captain hadn't been a captain or at sea in decades, in decades. So he was not, familiar, you know, he just not experienced and up to date with nav current navigation, boats, etc. And so because of that, the Meduse was um, kind of sailing off the coast of uh, Western Africa, Northwest, Northwestern Africa. And the, the captain didn't realize that the, the shoreline was pretty shallow, pretty far out at sea, right? So what happened is that the ship actually ran aground still fairly far away from shore or any any place where you know you could f feasibly uh take a raft and or a boat right and so what happened as a consequence is that so the, if the ship was wrecked there was only enough lifeboats for a certain number of the crew and so they're trying to figure this out and so they said well why not uh, the, the majority of, you know, some of the, the, the sailors, they'll just be on these rafts and we'll pull them with ropes on our boats. Um, and, and that's how we'll, we will all get to safety. Well, that was actually very cumbersome and it wasn't feasible for these small little boats to do. And so they decided to just cut loose those sailors and just let them go adrift and die and horribly, you know, be eaten by sharks die from hunger, exposure, et cetera. And so it was this huge fiasco, this negligence of this captain, but also for many, including Jericho, they just saw it as another example of the problems with monarchy, that they're not actually interested in people and thinking about the, the, the community and the, and the society as a whole. They were just thinking about like their own uh their own ideas and just helping their friends right so this you know this captain who wasn't ex experienced at all to do this job and jericho is showing the sailors that were cut loose he's shows them in various states of of aliveness 
Uh, notice in the foreground here we have just using the, the, the yellow, that kind of greenish yellow to really highlight, um, you know, gangrene, but also death, right? And then we just looking at the composition, a wonderful triangular composition where everyone is kind of reaching up and looking and swirling up at this one point. This one sailor right here who has the, the, the flag, right? A bits and pieces of the French flag waving, waving in the distance. And they are waving. Notice they're all pointing to something at the horizon, and they are actually looking at something. And do, do you guys see? Can you see what they're they're looking at? Can you locate it? If if you're kind of if you are very microscopically looking at this little blurb right here, it's it's a tiny uh, silhouette of what looks like some sort of boat, right? And so Jericho is giving us a moment of, of death, of desperation, of this kind of joy, this manic joy of seeing something in the distance, or, or is he, right? And what I love about this painting and how clever Jericho is with his narrative composition, that he's creating a narrative, is that it could go both ways, right? Remembering the story I just told. We could see this boat as the raft that cut them loose, right? And they, they, this is not manic joy, this is panic. This is desperation. They're saying, no, don't do this. Don't do this at all. And we see the effects, right, of it, that these, these men will perish and, and many of them did. They were eventually rescued, but many of, of the, the, many died um, in, this, in this event. Or you could see it as as their rescue, right? That this is the the rescue uh, mission, um, and then it is joy, right? So we are asked to be either in pure panic or pure joy, and so probably if we're thinking about what what ideology, we know the ideology. He is saying something about the negligence of the monarchy and the mismanagement of um, the navy, right? because of the monarchy. So that's the ideology. We know his perspective. He's thinking about people. He's thinking about society. So he's, what is he using? Well, he's using a lot of pathos, right? Really asking us to look at these faces and just put ourselves in this moment of, it's a nightmare. I mean, this is probably a lot of people's nightmares when they have nightmares of being adrift at sea. It's one of the reasons why I don't like open water. Uh, it makes me very nervous. I also don't like water where I don't know what's swimming underneath me. These are all fears that he is tr definitely trying to, to make us think about. And, 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 and if we can connect our emotion to the desperation of these men, we, that, that adds to how we think about this entire story, this entire ideology. Like, oh yeah, this was really negligent, right? He, it's very persuasive. And it's also appealing to our ethics. Like what's right and wrong? You know, it's, you know, it's wrong to put people in positions where they are taking, they are responsible for other people when they are not um, capable of doing it and thinking about, well, who appoints those people? That is definitely thinking about ethics. So we have pathos and logos um, working really well to, to really make us, you know, put, put, our, put us on a, the, a side of this, of this um, particular historical event. And a little bit differently, going kind of <laughs> moving forward in time, right? Still related to politics and um, systems of governance, right? We were now in the 1930s in the context of, of the United States, North America, and we have um, this the ideology, this conflict that I am going to be talking about for the next couple of slides is the battle between capitalism and communism which has a very long history, longer than I, I have for this particular class. But for the context of understanding the art, the two artworks that we're gonna see in the context of capitalism and communism, in the 1930s, this was you know, right before World War II broke out, 
Uh, we have um, coming out of the, the communist revolution, the so socialist revolution that were happening in the Soviet Union, which was essentially, if we're thinking about the original revolutions in Russia that created the Soviet Union, it was all about workers' rights. Workers' rights against the monarchy, if we're thinking about the, the Bolshevik revolution that happened in Russia against the, the czars. And then later, later movements of, of, of people who control the, the labor and the money, right? The, and that would be the, the industry owners, right? So from the ideology of, of communism, it's, it's th rethinking not only governance, but also an economic system of one that should be ruled or should be controlled or benefit the worker and, and the work and workers rights, right? Of course, it's a lot more complicated than that, but we're, we're doing the cliff note cliff notes version. And then we have capitalism, which is um, there, there are workers involved in capitalism, but it is there is a, a strong sense of, of a top down, right, that the, there are these captains of industry, especially for thinking about the 1930s. This is really when uh, global industry, global capitalism was really, you know, ramping up, right? Uh, steel production, railroad, oil, all of these things, factories, cars. Um, and there's a sense that, you know, you have the workers that are working to, to um, you know, bolster the economy, but the economy that is being run by, not necessarily, they don't have direct control of like what's being traded, who owns things, etc. Right, um, and so of course you can see how ca something like capitalism and communism would be uh, at odds on the perspective of the worker, but also who owns um, the majority of the industry. Cliff Notes version. Okay, so let's get to this mural. So this mural was uh, was painted by D uh, Diego Rivera, a very famous and well-known Mexican-American muralist during the 30s. He was the, the husband of Frida Kahlo, if you've heard of Frida Kahlo. And he was asked, because he, he was a popular muralist during this time, and he was asked by a lot of different public uh, and public and private buildings to cre create these large-scale murals. And a mural is just a large painting in an interior, an exterior of a building. And the site that he was asked was 30 Rockefeller Plaza in New York City. Maybe that's familiar to you if you've, if you've watched 30 Rock, but um, Rockefeller Plaza, um, there, a lot of news channels come out of, come out of there, um, but it was made by the Rockefellers and the, the Rockefeller family that was a, they were captains of industry, that family. They, they were in steel, they were in oil, they were in a lot of, of different things. And especially in New York City being steel magnets, the New York City was being rebuilt basically with steel skyscrapers. So the Rockefellers really saw themselves as not only these captains of industry, but them actually building and re remaking uh, what would be kind of a mo the modern America, right? The modern America that um, is capitalist, um, free market, etc. And so the, this family, the Rockefellers, asked Diego Rivera to basically make a mural about how capitalism is in response to communism. So it's kind of like capitalism versus communism. And he was like, okay, I'll, I'll do that. And so the center of the mural is this symbol of, of capitalism. And so notice we have a, a, the worker, right? Um, who is, you know, watching and, and manipulating a technology, right, for, for capitalism, right? So they're, they're, it's not that the workers so d disentangled, right, if it's part of the system, but this system, right, of capitalism, this larger kind of, and this hand, you can see this hand is the hand, the ominous hand of capitalism as this thing that's holding everything together. And, but it's also something that is a tool for understanding our world and making it better. So notice we have crops. Capitalism will help us, um, you know, with agriculture. It will help us with looking at the stars. Look at the micro, look at these little microbes underneath the, in these, understanding both of the molecular and the celestial, right? It's this tool for knowledge, 
and innovation and technology, right? So he, this is so okay. Yeah, that's great, right? Great. Um, but problems arose with this mural for the Rockefellers in his depictions of capitalism on one side and communism on the other side and what they're saying. What was Diego's personal ideology on this issue? Well, Diego Rivera was, uh, you know, was someone who's very sympathetic with socialist uh, movements and communist movements. And so there were there was a thought that this mural actually was saying that communism, which is over here, capitalism is over here, is actually better or a better system than capitalism, which was not the, the, the motive. That was not the, that was not what the Rockefellers as these captains of industry wanted. They wanted capitalism to be better than, than communism or, or socialism. And maybe you can pinpoint a couple things or aspects of this mural that would suggest that you know the, the the depiction of the capitalist society is uh, is he's critiquing it a bit right and, and we can pinpoint a, a couple i'm not because I, I don't want this this episode to be so long um but let's see so on the top right away we have look at these these men in gas masks and bayonets this 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 war right the scene of war which is kind of um, out of place if we're thinking of let's glorify capitalism by showing that it, 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 it feels something like mass war, right? And so this is, you know, right before World War II, you know, it was, you know, kind of coming out, there's World War One, right? There's a lot of turmoil, though, that is happening around the globally, right? So kind of war is kind of on the, the horizon in a lot of ways. So he's making a connection. Well, capitalism, yeah, you can control and innovate, but sometimes that innovation is at the cost of human life um, and creates these kind of global, global conflicts. And then you have this little vignette right here of just these people just playing cards and gambling and kind of just dancing. So there's this frivolity, the superficiality of well, capitalism creates the environment for not only war, but for people to just kind of de be detached and benefit from all of this. That they have money to just go off somewhere and just they're not touched by the turmoil and the precarity of life. Um, right. And so he's kind of he's making the, the this very ideological stance on how he feels capitalism affects society versus, you know, what he's depicting over here. Here we have Lenin, right? The kind of the, the historical leader of, the, of what would be the Bolshevik revolution, right? In, in Russia. And we, but we have all of these workers at a, at a May Day, at, they're at a May Day parade, which um, May Day, May 1st is, is uh, even now is celebrated as this celebration of labor, of, la of the labor movement historically of workers. And so they're all kind of moving towards something. They're they're trying to make things better, right? And notice they're they're very attentive to to Lenin. And Lenin, look, is is holding the hands of 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 a of people of different men um, that are from different walks of life, right? Dif different racial groups, different um, economic classes. So he's really seeing communism as something that brings people together versus capitalism, which tears people apart. Right. And just a little bit of the controversy again, the Rockefellers saw this finished mural and they did not like it and it was destroyed. Um, and that what we're looking at is actually a replica that Diego Rivera did in um, in Mexico. And so this is what they wanted for Rockefeller Center. And so they scrapped that. And, and instead, the Rockefellers decided to go with this sculpture on the outside of the building. And this is a sculpture by Paul Manship, and its title is Prometheus, and it's from 1934, and it's a bronze sculpture. And um, so, so what is what is this all about? Well, Prometheus is a figure from Greek mythology. Famously, he was a titan who was very sympathetic to humans. Who, at this point in Greek mythology, humans were basically shells, husks, had no intelligence, no technology. They basically just worshiped the gods and they didn't really have free, free thoughts. 
Um, and Prometheus was really sympathetic to humans. He wanted humans to be self self-creating that you wanted them to have intelligence and science and all of those things that the gods had and so he stole fire from zeus fire a symbol for innovation intelligence um free thought and he stole that fire from zeus and gave it to humans and thus humans um even though they still worship the gods they were not just pure subjects of worship they had they had their own ideas and zeus famously did not like this and um, made Prometheus uh, tr tragically be tortured for all eternity by having his liver eaten out by an eagle every day. And of course, because he's immortal, it grows back and thus the cycle begins, right? And so thinking about that backstory and thinking about the Rockefellers as a family that saw themselves as giving America the tools to innovate and succeed in this modern world with steel, railways, etc. Um, well, Prometheus is a perfect um, symbol for that because Prometheus himself gave humanity innovation and free thought. And so, so we have an image of Prometheus kind of launching himself from um, the rock, right? Um, uh, and he's going through the celestial ring, which has the zodiac signs, and he's kind of flying towards Earth with this flame. And of course, the bronze so wonderfully references that flame, that spark of intelligence. And behind uh, Manship's Prometheus, we have um, a dedication and a quote that is meant to be read in with this sculpture and it reads over here prometheus teacher in every art brought the fire that hath proved to mortals a means to mighty ends right and so very loaded with the ideology of the rockefellers that they were captains of industry they believed that capitalism was was like prometheus it gives humanity tools to to innovate um, and to to think for themselves and by proxy the Rockefellers at the center that the, the Rockefellers are also um, doing that work and so let's think about these together right two very different perspectives in the same space um, what are they activating ethos pathos logos right I feel you know there's a strong sense I mean these are all things that are subjective you might think something else but I'm thinking, looking at it, there's a lot of ethics. What is right and what is wrong? I mean, we literally have two sides. You're either on this side or this side. And as I said at the beginning of the episode, ethical persuasion is very much black and white. It's asking you that you're either, it's either the right way or the highway. And there really isn't a gray area or, or it wouldn't be an effective approach if people are like, mm, I don't know, I can see both sides. It wouldn't be effective persuasive tactic if, if for ethics, if, if uh, they don't want people to have that gray perspective. And so very, very ethical. And in here too, we don't have that, you know, juxtaposition black and white, but you get a sense, right? Um, I mean, that it's either innovation or, or what? Humanity is lackluster, humanity is stagnant, humanity is not gonna succeed, right? Um, without this power, without this family. So very much ethical. And, all, <laughs> and going forward in time, a, a decade or so, um, something that is very much <laughs> probably activating maybe all three um, of, of these things. And in the context of World War II, which I'm sure many of us are, are aware of that history, um, but of course, um, you know, the, you know, a, a war effort against, you know, the Nazi party in Germany, right? And uh, a very devastating war. Um, and here we have a poster from that it was coming out of the United States during 1942. And it had a very specific purpose, uh, a lot of purposes. And it's a poster with the title, Don't Let the Shadow Touch Them. And it says, don't let the, tato, the shadow touch them by war bonds. And so during World War II, it, you know, there was an effort um, 
by the government to have citizens rally together to help the war effort, which was really draining. Um, and just coming out of the Great Depression, it was very, very draining. Even though World War II actually did jumpstart the American economy out of the Depression, but there was a sense of co co community that we as, you know, we, quote unquote, uh, Americans need to rally together to stop the threat of, of, not, of Nazism, right? Against the, you know, the world that was going to just be spreading, right? If we didn't do anything. And so there are things like rationing. Maybe some of you have heard your, your family, um, you know, who've lived during, lived during a time talk about rationing that they, you know, you could only um, buy some things you, you had a, a fuel, there was gas quotas, right? Um, and, but there was a sense that you're giving up a lot, but it's for that, that higher purpose, that greater purpose. What you also could do was buy a war bond, right? So you give, you buy this bond that gives, that goes to the war effort that then you could cash in later, right? Um, for, to get your money back. So it was basically investing in, in the war effort, right? And so this poster was would be disseminated around um, the U.S. and, and it, the ideology is persuade. It, it, we need to stop the Nazi threat. We need to support the war effort. We need to we need to give up what little we have. You just penny give some something to the war effort because we, it's we are all in it. And this image, and I, and I really love, I love this poster because it says, don't let the shadow touch them. The shadow in the background being um, the swastika, which is the, you know, was the, used by the Nazis as their, as their symbol. And this shadow is being cast over this, you know, very idealized, typical, if we're thinking of the 40s, American family, which means white and middle class, right? Um, but these, you know, these children who are looking very scared, right? And notice, look, like this one is, is holding a, a model warplane. We have this um, little guy with a makeshift little flag. And then we have um, this little girl with her doll, right? And they're looking very scared and they're looking up at the shadow, the swastika, right? The shadow of Nazism that could come over the Atlantic, right? Over the Pacific. And come to come to shore, come to the the U.S. Right. And so, what do you think it's using? Ethos, pathos, logos. I would probably argue maybe it's using all of them. Right. Logos, the war bonds. Right. It makes sense. Right. Logic. We we need to invest in this effort. Right. To to win the war, and we need to rally together. That's very logical. Right. Pathos. The use of children is always going to evoke emotion. It's a very popular persuasive tactic. It's of showing children in pain or frightened um, or in distress or, or or something. It's very it's a very common thing because we, we we can't not have a reaction to that, right? Um, and but then also ethics, right? There is two one like there are two sides. You either are you know, they're with the children trying to protect them, or you are the shadow that is coming over, right? It's an either or. And so it really is activating all of them, which I mean, I think it makes for a very persuasive poster for, you know, this particular intention, this particular ideology. Continuing in the same year as that poster, also thinking about World War II, we have a totally different, use, well, similar use of children, but totally different perspective on the war, World War II and the war effort. And this is a very uh, famous image uh, made by the photographer Dorothea Lange, who was working um, during the war with the, with the WPA um, artists were being hired by the government to go out into communities and document everyday life. What, what was life like for Americans, everyday Americans, um, to showcase, you know, struggle, um, but, uh, but also just everyday life. And a, a lot about the, the diversity of America, of the American experience. And so Dorothea Lange um, did a lot of photos um, and this one is of Japanese American children pledging allegiance to the American flag before being interned in a relocation camp, right? And so we have these children 
Um, we're, we're looking frontally at them and, you know, they're, we know that they're doing the Pledge of Allegiance because, you know, they have their hand over their heart and they're, they're probably looking at a flag that, but we don't see it because we're facing them. We see some, some uh, adults in the background, um, but, um, you know, we, we see, you know, a very close cropped with our Japanese American, um, children kind of right up front, front and center. And so Dorothea Lang, what, what is the ide ideology that she's having? It's related to World War II, and it's referencing what happened to Japanese Americans and, and uh, families during this time of uh, being forcefully relocated and interned in, in, turn, in concentration camps in various parts of the United States. Some of them were in New Mexico um, near Santa Fe, and these and the Jap these were Amer these were American citizens, like American citizens that were forcibly interred because they were Japanese and had Japanese uh, heritage, right? Um, and that has everything to do with the fact that Japan was with the the um, the Axis power, so they were um, allies with uh, Nazi Germany during World War II, and so the whole you know the government interned japanese americans because there was this anxiety that they they were a threat because um japan w was was with the nazi um with nazi germany during that conflict and so what what is she doing what is she doing with this image dorothea lang well she's showcasing them doing the pledge of allegiance right these very sweet very um, happy to be saying the Pledge of Allegiance children right before they were relocated, taken from their homes. And a lot of times fathers were, were separated from um, their families um, and, and put somewhere else. And just putting a message of, well, you know, th these are these are American citizens and what are we doing? And definitely focusing on children too, really like our, our poster is making us feel something about that ideology of, of, of feeling something for these children, um, seeing the joy in their eyes, doing the Pledge of Allegiance and rethinking and or critiquing um, the internment um, process and, and that history in the United States um, that uh, the government did against actual citizens, right? So once again, we have, we have a lot of ethos, we have a lot of pathos, right? Um, going on in, in a similar image from World War II. And in our last image from World War II, sort of, um, we're gonna go for a full circle again. 1943, Norman Rockwell, very famous uh, painter. Uh, he did art for magazines, right? Um, and he did a very famous uh, a series of four paintings that were reproduced everywhere. And they were called the Four Freedoms. The four freedoms of the U.S., freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom of fear, freedom of want. And these were uh, used very much like at the poster of the children to support the sale of war bonds, right? And um, using a lot of pathos, a lot of, a lot of etho, uh, ethos, right, of showcasing, right, the the things uh, uh, the freedoms of America that that should be fought for and invested in against th a threat you know so like looking outward like looking outward um, and but, but to producing these very idealized and romanticized image imagery I mean especially this one of, of things that this kind of iconic Thanksgiving dinner um, and, uh, and, and, and then this one too, of, 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 this is the freedom of speech of a man speaking up in a town hall, um, saying his piece and saying his mind. These are very idealized, right? They're, they're showcasing, well, this is, you know, um, the romanticized view of the, of the war effort versus, you know, Dorothea Lang is thinking inwardly. Well, you know, what, what are some of the realities of that same history, that same process of, of, of thinking? But they're both activating ethos, pathos, um, to, to persuade us um, to, in, in a certain perspective. And then we have perspectives of the impact of war, the environmental, societal impact of war um, and devastation and destruction, the after effects, the fallout of World War II, which was nuclear weapons, right? 
World War II, we saw the release of the world's first nuclear bomb um, on Hiroshima. Um, and, and then, but then in Europe too, totally devastated cities, basically destroyed from bombs and warfare. And so we have two artists I want to show that are, are imagining the landscape of post-World War II Europe and Japan. And here's Europe after the rain too, 1941. And you can see just this, it's this, almost this post-apocalyptic city scene, right? Really activating a lot of, a lot of pathos and ethos uh, and, per, and perhaps logos of the logic, right? Think, make us think about, well, what, was it worth it? Like, was it worth devastation? It, you know, thinking about, you know, this is an ethical statement. Is, is this how we want modern society to be? Do we really want, you know, human life to be so um, uh, at risk uh, of conflict and, and especially the harnessing of devastating weapons, chemical warfare, nuclear warfare? And that carries over in this really, really wonderful ink painting um, by uh, Maruku Uri and Maruku Toshi of the, the, the Hiroshima panels from 1950 that are imagining the moment of that nuclear blast and the and its effect on bodies and really and this is an example of how art and the style of art, especially ink painting, which has this very atmospheric um, sense to it, this fluid fluidity. And so you get a sense of that you, you don't necessarily see radiation. Radiation is, you only see the effects of radiation. You don't actually see um, it, you know, through the air. But you get a sense that you actually see it. You see it happening and, you, and it becomes very real. Um, nuclear fallout, uh, its effects on actual bodies, right? And very much activating pathos, ethos, and logos, right? Asking is is what is it what is it all for? What it, what is this? What is technology doing? What you know, you know? With great power comes great responsibility. Sort of ideology here um, of the greater effects of the war that you know we continue to to live with um, radiation, um, et cetera. Especially um, us in New Mexico with the the legacy of the Trinity test um, at Los Alamos Laboratory. And so the next couple of slides, I'm, I'll, I'll work through a little faster because now we're going to think about, well, how does this ideology about war, about what, what does what is the modern, what does modern life look like? Um, and now we're going into the 60s and 70s and thinking about the Cold War. So back to communism versus capitalism. Um, the Cold War was, you know, and, and nuclear weapons of, uh, you know, the Soviet Union and the United States really at odds, and it was about the space race, nuclear warfare. There was this threat of that that one one country was was on the trigger button of nuclear war, and it was much very much an anxiety during the 60s and 70s. But there was also this, you know, we also have other conflicts happening. We have Vietnam, the Vietnam War. We have, if we're thinking about the U.S. specifically, we have this proliferation of mass culture and consumerism post-war. So the economy had a boost. There's this emphasis on buying and advertising and consumerism as that is what makes um, a good life is to have, you know, all the electronics and have everything um, basically marketed to you. And so we have someone like Martha Rossler who, who created this inkjet uh, print. It's a photo montage where she's using different images from different sources, magazines, um, uh, uh, photo journalism to say something about consumerism and conflict. Um, and so here she has an image from um, Vietnam, right? So, uh, you know, soldiers. And then we have it spliced with these this very elaborate drapery, this mid-century drapery with this um, model who probably was selling vacuum cleaners um, in a magazine. And so how Martha Rossler puts things together, you get a sense of her perspective. What does she think about this, the consumer culture, the Cold War? Well, probably saying, well, well what is fueling? Like, do, do people who, during this era, when they buy the newest refrigerator, do they think about how 
war continually sustains an economy that uh, you know pr produces um, all of these kind of quote unquote luxury goods, and they would be a luxury back then, right? The idea of everyone having a dishwasher was a novel idea um, during this time. And just rethinking about where what's the source of uh, the goods that we that we buy, like well, what is what is the chain, right? What well, what don't we see um, uh, that is kind of glossed over by marketing and you know shiny, aesthetically pleasing. Uh, <laughs> Uh, vacuum cleaners, which is, you know, it looks like a little purse. <clears throat> and then we also have in, in our last few, well, let's think about, well, what about ideologies that aren't necessarily economic or political? What about social and thinking about the histories of um, identity, identity um, in, in, in America in particular? And so this is Glenn Lingen's um, Double America Two from 2014. And it's a work that is thinking about American society and its history and its entire history. So 2014, there's a lot of history to think about. Um, and just as, as, an, as the artist's own perspective, very interested in the history of racial inequity and violence um, going all the way to uh, the, it's the slave trade um, the Civil War, post post Civil War segregation, and just the long history of 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 of, of race in America, and so he has two Americas, right? And what would happen in this installation is that one flickers on and the other flicks off in various patterns. So it's constantly switching from America to its mirror, right? And thinking about that, he's thinking about well, how there there is often two Americas that you sometimes see, right? You see the America that is that idealized, Nor Norman Rockwell, very idealized, romanticized America of all of these freedoms and ideals that everyone, you know, should be able to live and, and do what they want and succeed, right? But then there's that, the, it flips, right? There's that mirror image of, you know, perhaps that is, you know, that is a, a version of America, but does does everyone have, that same possibility, right? Is it harder for uh, for some people to have to reach that ideal, or is that ideal really can, can it be really? Can you really do it, right? And so flicking you back and forth, that there's this constant flickering of, you know, I have hope, I, I have I have all of this gusto to do something with my life, but then do I ha do I face certain things that? That stop me from doing that, and and why do they stop me from doing that? Uh, and so very much he's activating this very much this ethics. Like once again, it's this this duality, black this kind of black and white, asking you to think about issues um, um, at the same time. Similarly, Carrie May Weems in her her series of. Um, of repurposed photo, old photographs. And here's one called From Here I Saw What Happened and I Cried um, from 1995. Someone also like Glenn Lingen, who's interested in American society and the history of racial inequality and violence. Her practice and what she did is that she she found historical um, photographs of of enslaved people back in uh, back back in the day. Um, which was pretty typical. Um, ph photography was used as this, a form of categorization and documentation. And, and we'll get to that in our photography uh, section later on in this course. But she was looking at it and she just, just as an as African-American woman, she, she says, I, I, she, in the title, from here I saw what happened and I cried, that th she was moved fundamentally by images of enslaved people that she wanted to repurpose them in a way that made viewers, the new viewers of these images, kind of rethink that history and maybe rethink the use of photography as a type of documentation to rethink American society or, uh, or to, to, to just to, or to be with her or to, to follow her and her emotional response to these images. And so here we have a lot of pathos, a lot of ethos, right? You, you can kind of see the power of ethos and pathos. We've seen a lot um, of, of it. Um, it's very effective. And so this is the last example, and, and I will let you go for today. Um, something fairly recent, even, you know, five, five years ago, 
This is Ai Weiwei, very famous um, installation artist, uh, international inter uh, uh, installation artist. And this is um, one called Soleil Levant. And it was an installation outside of the Kristall Charlottesburg in Denmark, which is a, um, it's a museum, an art museum in Denmark. And he chose to, so what we're looking at is um, uh, one side of the museum that is facing the canal, um, the harbor in Denmark. And so he has filled the windows of the museum with life jackets, so a varying color. So, you know, classic life jacket colors, that bright orange, you know, made so that you, that you can see, you can see someone adrift on a raft. You see how we've come full circle from the raft of the Medusa, um, but also different colors. And so he's using the different life raft, uh, life, life vest, colors to create this almost like this sunset it almost looks like how the sun would look coming down on the harbor uh when it hits the, the water and, and all the ripples kind of are churn and, and some are blue some are orange some are black right so he's mimicking um the the soleil levant which means um sunset right and and so, but what's the purpose? What's the ideology? Why is he referencing this? Why is he doing this? Why is he using these life vests? Well, the, during this period, there was a, a, a great deal of asylum seekers that um, wanted to come into Denmark and the European Union in general that were that were, were not being given asylum. Um, and so he's commenting on, you know, well, this idea of safe harbor, you know, we think about harbors, Think about Ellis Island is on a harbor of people that there is a safe harbor that people can come to, right? And if there is this idea that you know, especially you know, Europe has the society that um, it is you know, is very beneficial to, to to its citizens, then you know, why aren't why don't you let more people in? Why do you you know? And he's really kind of critiquing um, that that idea of being open but not open, um, to be welcoming but not welcoming. And, but he, you know, he's also referencing something from the past. He's actually referencing art history, uh, in particular, Claude Monet, a French painter, impressionist paper called Impression de Soleil Levant, right? So you get to see where the title comes from. And uh, this was painted in 1872. Similarly, it is a harbor scene, and you can see where the orange comes in and the reflecting on the water. Um, and so, in a similar way, though, Claude Monet, um, while he wasn't painting something from the ideology of, well, let's think about asylum, polit asylum policies and immigration politics, etc., he was thinking about how the city has changed, right? He's working right at the onset of the Industrial Revolution and cities were becoming very polluted with coal dust in particular. And the, this bright sunset, right, is something that happens when there is a lot of particulates in the air. So for instance, you know, in, in, in Southern California, there's this thing called golden hour, you probably maybe you've heard of it, where the sunsets look super orange and people love, you know, taking pictures of them and they are very striking and beautiful. Um, at this, they're beautiful, but at the same time, you know it's because of the pollution um, that is causing these vivid, vivid sunsets, right? And so Claude Monet is, is thinking about that, is, is thinking about the effects of the change of the city on the environment and the light and everything that's happening there in the environment. And so Ai Weiwei is thinking about that at the same way, but the, the changing city, right? It's not, uh, not uh, atmospheric, but, in, but also environmental, right? Thinking about community and who who has access to the benefits of society uh, or the protection of society. So that's that's art as an ideological subject. Hopefully you, you found this fun and interesting to to think about. Um, and I will I will see you back later.